Okay. So, <coughs> the meteorite in question is this ALH 84001. ALH stands for Allen Hills. It's a site in Antarctica. Yep. Wait, were we supposed to take the quiz on this? There was a quiz on this as well, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, so for Thursday, there's going to be a quiz on the Viking biology experiments, but there, yeah, there was a quiz uh, on this as well. Okay. So uh, this was the paper in Science, uh, in the journal Science, that started all of this interest in this meteorite and whether it in Included evidence for fossil evidence for uh, early life on Mars. Um, Jalen. How did they know that the meteorite is from Mars? That's the question we're going to address in about two slides. So, just in general, Okay, so here are some basic claims about this rock. It's essentially, all of this uh, controversy, all of this excitement, all of this brouhaha, if I can use that, uh, is around a rock. Uh, it's about a potato size, a large potato size chunk of rock um, that was found in Antarctica. And before we even get to the evidence about life, here's some background claims that uh, have been made about this rock. That it is a meteorite, that it came from Mars. So the story of this rock is that this rock, as a rock on Mars, formed very early during the history of, of, of Mars. Um, Billions of years ago, uh, shortly after the formation of the planet, is what was thought. Uh, was sitting there on the planet for a long period, for a long time. At some point early in Mars's history, the story of this rock is that there was a nearby impact that uh, shocked the whole area, cracked the rocks in the area led to these fractures running throughout this rock. Then the, uh, uh, the next bit of the story is that the rock itself was ejected from Mars some millions of years ago out into space. And then some thousands of years ago, um, the orbit of that rock intercepted with the orbit of the Earth, and the rock landed on the Earth, and it was then collected by a team that was down in Antarctica in 1984 looking for meteorites. Okay, so those are basic claims. Now, what is the evidence that uh, supports each one of those claims? Okay, so how do we know, how do we distinguish a rock that's a rock versus a rock that's a meteorite? Okay. So, I mean, the first claim here is that uh, we have this, this rock actually is a meteorite, and um, this idea of a fusion crust is critical evidence to support that. What distinguishes a meteorite from a rock uh, here on the Earth. What's the biggest difference between the two of those? Um, yeah, you're jumping ahead a little bit. We'll get back to that. But I'm thinking just in general, what, what makes a meteorite a meteorite as opposed to regular rock? Um, you mean like as opposed to a Mars rock or an Earth rock? As opposed to an Earth rock. You're, you're, too, you're getting too complicated here. Comes from space, right? Okay. So basically, 
the biggest thing that distinguishes all meteorites from rocks on Earth is that they've come from space, and therefore they've had to come screaming through the Earth's atmosphere. When they come screaming through the Earth's atmosphere, what's going to happen to the surface of that meteorite? Well, it's going to be... Actually, there's not going to be a crater because these small things hit at a terminal velocity that aren't, that's not big enough to get a crater. It's going to be all burned on the outside. It's going to get all very hot coming through the Earth's atmosphere. And so, I mean, the basic evidence that... that uh, ALH 84001 was a meteorite was that it had this characteristic fusion crust on the outside where the outside of the meteorite um, had been heated up through the through the <coughs> transit through the atmosphere um, we have a claim that it's a, not only a meteorite, but it's a meteorite from Mars. So there was something about the uh, composition of the gases that somebody mentioned. You were talking, okay. So if you look at the gases inside, the meteorite, uh, the isotopic composition of the oxygen, the nitrogen, the argon, and so forth match those of the atmosphere of Mars that had been sampled by the you know, Viking landers in 1976. Uh, so we've got this Martian meteorite and all of these different uh, aspects of its history. Jalen. Uh, it does. So, is that a reasonable assumption? Um, quite likely it is. The isotopes of argon, for example, are not going to change over geological history on Mars because argon, all the isotopes of argon are so heavy that you don't have to worry about lighter isotopes being lost to space, things like that. Um, what I want to do um, in going through the evidence for some of these things is kind of walk, walk through this process backwards a little bit. So in addition to having a fusion crust, one of the big supporting evidence for, it, for ALH84001 being a meteor is related to where it was collected. Pretty much every year the National Science Foundation and other groups send researchers down to these ice fields in Antarctica and you can see that they spend time just uh, zooming around on the ice fields on, um, on snowmobiles and looking for rocks. And there's a high probability that any rocks they find are going to be meteorites. Why? Yeah, these ice fields are several kilometers thick. The, you know, the bedrock is way down at the bottom. Generally speaking, snow falls on the surface and gets compacted into ice and that ice then gradually works its way down through these glacial masses down to the bedrock, down to lower elevations. <coughs> there aren't really any mechanisms in the glacier to scoop rocks up from the bottom of that several kilometer thick layer of ice and move the terrestrial rocks up to the surface. So these ice fields are happy hunting grounds for meteor hunters. Um, the meteorites tend to be uh, have this dark fusion crust. They, you can see how they stand out against the uh, against the ice, and so you just have teams going across the surface. Um, <coughs> looking for rocks and uh, when they find them they carefully collect them put them into 
you know, um, clean, sterile bags uh, for taking back to the lab for analysis. Okay, we talked a little bit about uh, fusion crust, uh, indicating that, um, you know, a meteorite is actually a meteorite. You can see how it's got this kind of shiny black uh, coating on the outer surface. But if you look, that fusion crust does not extend very deeply into the meteor, meteorite. Okay. Um, when the meteorites, when the meteors, meteoroids, are out in space, what temperature are they going to be at? Very, very, very cold. Okay. Then they intercept the Earth, they come screaming through the atmosphere, the outer surface of the meteorite heats up due to the friction with the atmosphere, but it takes a long time to conduct that heat into the interior of these rocks. And so generally speaking, it's only the outer crust of the rock that gets uh, heated up and fused into this fusion crust as, um, as the rocks come slamming down through space. Now, uh, this claim that it's a meteorite from Mars, we've already talked about this a little bit. This figure here just shows that uh, this is not actually for ALH84001. It's for a different Martian meteorite. This uh, EETA79001, another meteorite collected from Antarctica. But uh, the basic point here is that if you look at the composition of gases inside little tiny air bubbles inside the rock, the concentration of the different isotopes of xenon and krypton and neon and argon and so forth uh, match up between what's in the rock here versus what's been measured in the atmosphere of Mars. Um, and so, I mean, all of these gases fall along this, this line here, indicating that the proportion of argon 80, or krypton 84 in the gas in the meteorite is essentially the same proportion of krypton 84 that was measured in the Martian atmosphere. Okay. So, um, two other claims about the history of this rock. Um, the researchers, I mean the only thing really that the researchers had was in 1984 in Antarctica they pick up a rock. That's the starting point. Uh, the next step is this looks like a meteor. Next step is this looks like a meteor from Mars. Well let's talk a little bit more about the history of that. How did it get from Mars to the Earth? What would have had to happen for that rock to get from Mars to the Earth? Not going to be any kind of aliens picking up rocks on Mars and dropping them in Antarctica. Um, I think I read that it was uh, an impact on Mars. Okay. Yeah, we've talked about impact processes. Generally speaking, when the impactor comes in, it throws up debris. Depending on the velocity and the angle at which the impactor comes in, that debris can be thrown up at a high enough velocity that it escapes Mars's gravity and goes into orbit around the Sun. Okay. So essentially, some impact had to have happened on Mars to kick the rock up off of the Martian surface. And then once it was out in space, uh, it would have had to eventually intersect with the Earth and come land on the Earth. Yeah, do. How big? Uh, Depending on angle and velocity, surprisingly small impactors can bump stuff up into space. Now, what size impactor they have figured for this meteorite, I'm not sure if they've got a good handle on that. 
You know, it would not have to be Hellas based in size impactor to do this. Smaller impactors than that easily loft stuff up high enough to escape uh, Mars gravity. M you know, Mars's escape velocity is a little bit less than that of the Earth, so it's a little bit easier to, to, to bump things up off of the surface of Mars into space than it is from the Earth. Uh, so it would have to be a, a significant impactor, but it would not have to be catastrophic. But, you I mean, two questions that arise then is, when would this impact have occurred? Meaning, how long was the rock out in space? And what, can we, what do we know about how and when um, that rock landed here on the Earth? <clears throat> so the specific claims... Uh, in terms of ALH 84001 is that about 16 million years ago was when this impact occurred knocking ALH 84001 out into space and at about 13 thousand years ago is when it landed uh, in Antarctica got buried in the ice field and <coughs> spent the last 13,000 years moving downhill through the ice field um, when the glacier when the glacial masses move to lower elevations uh, in Antarctica the winds tend to evaporate the ice from the ice field gradually um, revealing the the rocks the meteorites that had been collected um, earlier. So these are two more claims. How do we know that it was 16 million years ago that this impact occurred? I mean, clearly no one was around to record that impact. What evidence could we use to, to make that claim? Yeah, but in this case, it's not actually measuring decay. When the rock is out in space, it's, a, it's exposed to cosmic rays. And so you can see those cosmic rays can, uh, you know, they're going to be coming from all directions. They're going to impact the rock. And as they do so, they're going to leave a, uh, an impact trail. And also those cosmic rays can generate different kinds of isotopes of, uh, of elements when they strike the, the minerals in, in the rock. So essentially the longer a rock is out in space, <coughs> the more it is bombarded by cosmic rays and just accumulates evidence of these impacts um, over time. And the more impacts there are, the longer it's been out in space. And so by looking at the accumulation of those cosmic ray impacts and the isotopes that result from them, um, people estimate that the rock has been exposed to cosmic rays for about 16 million years, based on what we know about the flux of cosmic rays. Now, it could have been out in space longer if it had been ejected as a larger boulder and then some subsequent collision out in space broke it apart to expose the rock 16 million years ago. But it's much more likely that the impact itself 16 million years ago um, ejected the rock into space. So we don't have to postulate that there was some secondary collision out in space that freed up this rock. <coughs> and then similarly you know, the longer the uh, meteorite is sitting in the glacial field in Antarctica, the more it is being weathered by sitting in the glacier, and the more those, uh, some of these unstable elements generated by cosmic rays um, begin to decay. So carbon-14 that had been produced by a cosmic ray impact out in space, that carbon-14 would decay over time 
um, uh, indicating how long it had been since the rock had been out in space. And then finally, the you know the big claims about the age of the rock deal with the fact that it's thought to have formed about four and a half billion years ago. So that would have been very early in the history of Mars, even kind of pre-Noachian. And that about four billion years ago, it had this impact that created all these little crevices and other environments where um, things could have accumulated, which will be a big part of the story. Won't go through all the details of radiometric dating, but uh, you know, basically by looking at the decay of radioactive elements like potassium-40 in the case of, of this potassium-argon dating, you know, when a rock is formed, it's going to have potassium in the minerals. Some of that potassium is going to be radioactive potassium-40 as the those um, radioactive elements decay they form um, they form atoms of argon that accumulate in the rock and by measuring the accumulation of argon you can tell you know how long it's been since that uh, rock crystallized things like that so these dates are fairly well established this is a rock this is pretty unique for Mars meteorites. Most of the meteorites we have from Mars are from much later in Mars's history, you know, less than a, b a billion years old. And we know by that point, Mars was not a very hospitable environment. It's cold already, it's dry, and so forth. This is really the only Mars meteorite we have that dates back to the earliest times on Mars. So why would we be especially interested in this Mars meteorite? Yeah, if there were ever going to be a time on Mars when we're thinking that life might have gotten going, it would have been very early in Mars's history when Mars was not as crappy as it is today. And so this is basically a sample from that time that's been delivered to us. So clearly, you know, there's going to be a lot of interest in this rock to, uh, to determine if there is any evidence of life from this early time in Mars's history that's been collected in the rock and delivered to the Earth as the rock came. <coughs> okay, I'm going to skip over this. If you, uh, if you look through the material for today, there's essentially four lines of evidence that the researchers put forward to argue that uh, this rock had evidence of fossil life. Now, clearly, <coughs> um, we're not looking for life that has survived from four billion years ago on Mars, right? We would be looking at fossils, and we would be looking at uh, fossils that are fossil materials that would have been uh, able to survive that four billion year time frame. So, as I said, there are essentially four lines of evidence that the researchers put together. Now, the point they made, and they made very strongly in their paper, was that any one of these lines of evidence by itself could be explained either by life or by non-living processes. Um, but, but what they're arguing in the paper is that by putting all four of them together, you know, at some point it's easier just to say that 
um, you know, it looks like there was life, rather than to have to come up with non-living explanations, separate non-living explanations for all these different patterns of evidence. <coughs> the first uh, line of evidence I want to present up here are, has to do with these PAHs, or these polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons. <coughs> these are your basic organic material, uh, carbon rings, um, I know you haven't had a lot of chemistry to be able to understand what the, or identify these, these formulas, but um, for example, uh, naphthalene here is a very simple PAH. It's a molecule that is formed of two carbon rings with hydrogen atoms on it. Um, it. How many of you are familiar with mothballs? Are mothballs still a thing that people are familiar with these days? These really stinky uh, things that you put in your closet to kill off moths from eating your sweaters? A uh, real blast from the past. Well, essentially, naphthalene is one of the major ingredients in that. So, you know, we're talking about aromatic hydrocarbons, uh, stinky ring-shaped structures. <coughs> These PAHs are oftentimes formed by the breakdown, the decomposition, and decay of living or organisms. So if you take all the organic matter... That's in uh, you know um, uh, fungus, uh, matter fungus, or uh, you know some insect or whatever, and you let decay processes occur, then um, you oftentimes get these PAHs uh, as part of the breakdown process. Now there are non-living ways to create. Um, PAHs. Um, you often find PAHs in response to combustion of material, but again, we're talking about organic material. So whether we're talking about diesel fuel or burning wood and so forth, those are essentially uh, breakdown products from living organisms. There are some fully <coughs> inorganic ways to create these, but they're but they're less common. And PAHs are, you know, just common around the globe. Even down in Antarctica, there would be PAHs from diesel exhausts and other things, um, you know, pollutants that had been distributed worldwide. So we have. Um, present in the meteorite, these organic compounds, these PAHs. How is that, I mean, how would that be evidence for the fact that this meteorite contains Martian evidence of, of past life on Mars? Jalen. Yeah. We think um, we think organic carbon is a fairly common, uh, very favorable structure to support living organisms. So if there was life early on Mars, it likely would have been carbon-based. And if that life had been living in this rock and had died and decayed, we might very well expect there to be Martian PAHs that came with the rock uh, on its journey through space. <coughs> How could you explain the presence of these PAHs without resorting to Martian microbes? If, it's not, if the PAHs aren't the breakdown residue from dead Martian microbes, how else could that PAH have gotten into the rock? 
Yeah. What it was burning up in the atmosphere? What it was burning up in the atmosphere? Would that uh, would that process produce uh, PAHs? Probably that process would actually um, eliminate or break down PAHs, especially in the fusion crust. And the inside of the rock wouldn't have heated up enough to actually create PAHs. So if anything, the journey through the atmosphere is going to get rid of uh, PAHs. Where else could they have come from? Um, not, not likely. I mean, the one, on the one hand, these pHs could be arguments for life on Mars, because that's what we would expect. But how would you explain this without any reference to these pHs being from Mars? After it landed, okay? This rock's been sitting out in Antarctica for 13,000 years, right? We know that there are PAHs all over the place on Earth. Maybe these are terrestrial contaminants. So to test for that, the researchers looked at, the <coughs> at where they found the PAHs in the uh, in the rock going from the surface of the rock inside and um, you know the, these graphs down here just show four separate kinds of PAHs and for each of these PAHs the uh, there there are no PAHs found at the surface of the rock and they're all found inside okay same thing here same thing here same thing here if this were a terrestrial contamination, if the rock landed on the earth and got contaminated with all the PAHs that we have here on the earth, then we would expect that, uh, if anything, the outside would have the most PAH. Clearly this is uh, PAHs that came from Mars, and the reason why we don't see any in the outer crust is uh, because of the... Um, the heat coming through the atmosphere broke them down in that fusion crust area. Okay, so that's one line. The other line of evidence, and the second line of evidence, are these very specific carbonate globules that are found in the fractures and pore spaces of the rock. <coughs> Again, carbonates can be uh, produced in a variety of different ways. But we find on the Earth, a lot of carbonate is produced by the activity of microorganisms, of organisms in general. Um, many of the limestone deposits we find here are uh, produced by microorganisms. Um, again, the uh, carbonate globules are... Um, Generally speaking, it's fairly clear that those were in the rock on Mars, and not some contamination from the Earth. Um, and if you look very carefully, you can see that you've got very distinct layers of different <coughs> kinds of minerals uh, in very close proximity to one another. This is the kind of process or pattern you, you oftentimes see with living organisms that can very carefully control uh, these kinds of gradients. It's much more difficult to get this from a non-biological uh, process. Um, some of the stronger evidence, though, deals with the presence of these magnetite crystals. We know on the earth um, a lot of organisms, microorganisms produce little magnetic crystals, magnetite. Bacteria use them uh, for navigation. 
Does it make any sense for Martian bacteria to have produced magnetite crystals? What do we know about magnetic field on Mars? There isn't any now. Four billion years ago, was there a magnetic field? Yes. Okay. So the fact that this meteor, you know, is a potential home for microbes from four billion years ago, well, maybe it makes sense for those microbes, Martian microbes, putative Martian microbes, to have created uh, magnetite crystals. <coughs> Again, magnetite can be produced by inorganic or non-living processes or by living organisms. Living organisms tend to produce magnetite crystals that are purer and more uniform in size than non-living processes. And the research um, on the magnetite crystals uh, from the meteorite tend to support that idea of much more uh, purified and uniform crystals. Then, you know, the uh, what what caught most people's attention were these structures under the microscope that look like little wormy things. <coughs> Cylindrical, segmented structures. Um, which look like fossil bacteria, but the problem is that they're very, very, very small. And so there's a lot of argument against this interpretation just based on the size of the, uh, um, the structures here. So, not belaboring it too much, essentially we've got researchers presenting these four different lines of evidence. Uh, any one of these lines of evidence could be argued away as due to non-biological processes. What the authors wanted to put forward in their paper is that, you know, having all four of these lines of evidence in the one rock, at some point it's, it's maybe just simpler to say, it looks like there was life in this rock. Now, that clearly was a very controversial interpretation. This uh, triggered a lot of work, and um, the upshot of the work today is that most researchers probably are not convinced that they have made an airtight case. Um, many of the original researchers involved in this study have continued to... to um, to look at this and other meteorites, but it may not be until we actually get some better samples uh, returned from Mars that we'll be able to follow this up. So, um, we will continue to talk about the reaction to this a little bit on Thursday before we start the Viking simulation, but I wanted to go through uh, these, these patterns of evidence.